any great psychologist is also a skilled magician. Now, before any of you future psychologists out there ditch the diplomas to be a Vegas headliner, let me explain. Since the inception of magic, magic and psychology have been inherently linked. In fact, many principles of psychology and neuroscience, such as attention, memory, and visual processing, were actually understood by magicians before being understood by scientists. But while magic and the theory of psychology are bound at the hip, magic and the practice of psychology, that would be the practice of therapy, also actually share some common goals focused on challenging the thinking of their respective audiences. I first began to see this link as an undergraduate student at Yeshiva University when I began a weekend job at a drug and alcohol rehab clinic for teenage boys. I'd like to share an interaction I had on my very first day with a 14-year-old boy. Let's call him John. I walked into the clinic on my first day to a room of 10 or 12 teenage boys having virtually no idea of what to do or say. John was sitting in the corner with his feet propped up on another chair, his arms crossed, looking at me kind of skeptically. As it had been a couple of months since I'd started learning card magic, I always carried cards with me to practice. So I took them out and walked over to John with a pick a card as I fanned the cards towards him. His hardened facade instantly melted as he began to engage with me. Eventually learned that John spent the greater part of his late childhood and early adolescence lying to, stealing from, and getting into trouble with his parents, his teachers, and his friends, which was the result of, but also contributed to, his seeing people as inherently untrustworthy. At the time, I began to see magic as a great medium to connect with people. That something about magic let people drop their guard, even for just a few moments, to allow for a genuine connection. It wasn't until years later did I begin to reflect on this interaction to really consider what might have been going on behind the interaction, which I'll return to shortly. The world is an incredibly complex place. If not for our abilities to learn and adapt, we'd be completely unable to function in the world. If you were to imagine seeing a light switch and needing to re-examine and experiment with how it worked every single time, needing to relearn that gravity pulls things down, or that if you see one side of an object with part of the view blocked, that the object continues, or if an object is removed from view, that it continues to exist. We spend our entire lives toiling over these non-essential details. To reduce the toll on how hard our brains have to work, we develop patterns and shortcuts to make it easier to interact with our environment. We group items into categories. We look for similarities among objects. And we create patterns to organize our perceptual experience. We also do this with principles of cause and effect, the rules that govern how our world works. This allows us to filter out information that we deem to be unnecessary. These shortcuts allow us make much more rapid evaluations about our world and allows us to make predictions about things that will happen in the future. Magicians understand these shortcuts that people use, and they'll use sleight of hand, misdirection, and other techniques to break the rules we have for how the world works. Let me give you a quick example. I have my trusty deck of cards. Out of the blue box, I pull out a red deck. Thank you. I won't tell you how I do it. I'll leave you slightly bewildered. Uh, sir, from your seat, can you help me just touch any card? I'll tell you what it is. It's, the, the cards are face up. It's, uh, I know this is stupid, but I know one of you is 
try this joke later. It's a little harder face down, but touch any card you like. Pull that card out, but don't show it to anyone. Keep that card to yourself. Actually, show it to your, the person sitting right next to you, okay? Now, it's critical you remember the card. If you don't, this trick becomes a lot less impressive, all right? Say stop whenever you'd like, preferably while I'm still dribbling the cards. Say stop with it right here. Okay, put your card over there. Excellent. And I will give the deck uh, about as fair of a shuffle as I could. And I hope you'd agree this will both look and sound like a fair shuffle. That sounds fair? Excellent. I will give the deck a couple of quick cuts. One final cut. And the cards are on the stool until the conclusion of this trick. I can't handle them. I can't manipulate them. I can't change the order. I can't steal cards off the top. I can't put cards back on. The cards will remain as they are until we finish. I'm going to need a couple of volunteers from the audience. Can I have the house lights for one second? Excellent. Um, so would you be able to help me? You can help me from your seat. OK. Uh, Ma'am, would you help me? Yeah, excellent. And, uh, and sir, would you help me? Excellent. I'd like you to each think of, uh, of a single number. All right, do you each have your numbers? Excellent. Scrap that number, think of an entirely different number. Do you have your new number? All of you, excellent. Uh, is there any way I can know what numbers you're thinking of? No, it's impossible. Did we arrange anything in advance? No. But not only can't I know what numbers you're thinking of, even you're thinking of a number you didn't think you'd think of until you're now no longer thinking of a number you think you'd think of. But even if I could know what number you'd think of, I can't know a number you'd think you'd think of if you weren't thinking of the number you'd think of, because the number you'd think of is the number you're now thinking of. You're thinking of the number you'd think of if you weren't thinking of the number you'd think of. You get what I'm thinking? Excellent. For the first time, sir, what's your number? Six, ma'am? Eight, six and eight is 14, and four. Six and eight is 14, 14 and four is uh, 18, if I'm not mistaken. Math was not my major undergrad. But we have a final number that was effectively randomly selected from the audience. And right now, our two gentlemen in the front are the only ones who know the identity of this card. Let's see what we have over here. I'll do this as cleanly and openly as possible. Our final number was 18. Is that correct? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. No switches. No sleight of hand, no misdirection. For the first time in a loud, clear voice, what was the name of your card? The Eight of Hearts. Why did this fool you? You have a number of assumptions about the randomness of numbers. The freedom of choice to freely select a number and to freely select a card and how playing cards work, and that if I shuffle a deck of cards, those cards really get mixed. You also have a number of assumptions based on what I've communicated to you during this trick. Using some sneaky techniques, I was able to use those assumptions to my advantage. What did it fool you? We also create similar shortcuts for how we think about and see ourselves. It's generally accepted that the experiences we have in life help shape what are called schema, which are mental frameworks for how we think about and organize our experiences. For example, based on our experiences, we know exactly what appropriate behavior is in a library, based on what our parents tell us, what the librarian tells us, how we observe other people acting in the library. So I could walk into any library on Earth, and as long as the library I walk into closely enough aligns with my schema for what a library is, I'll know precisely how to act. These schemas impact what are called core beliefs, which are firmly held thoughts we have about ourselves, about the world, and about our futures. These schemas also impact what are called automatic thoughts, which are instantaneous thoughts we have in response to a given situation. These core beliefs and automatic thoughts are essential for us to make more accurate and rapid assessments about the world. But sometimes, those assessments we make result in inaccurate judgments. For example, let me tell you about an Army veteran who I worked with at a Veterans Affairs Hospital. Uh, let's call him Mike. Prior to his enlistment in the military, Mike was a social, outgoing guy, liked going to the movies, to restaurants, events, places that are generally safe. 
And in fact, this was reflected in Mike's schema for the world, in which he generally thought of the world as a safe place. During his deployment, Mike was exposed to a number of combat situations, which challenged his view of the safety of the world, to the point that when he returned to America, he stopped leaving his house altogether, because to him, nothing was safe. Despite having never experienced danger at the movies, at a restaurant, or at a sports arena, Mike's new schema for the world had him perceiving these to be dangerous places. His core beliefs, those firmly held thoughts we develop, became, I can't leave my house, something terrible will happen, and the world is no longer safe. Then, in response to a given situation, like a friend inviting him to a concert, for example, Mike experienced the automatic thought of, oh, I can't go there, there's going to be an attack and I won't be able to escape. This is a presentation that's consistent with PTSD, which is traumatic stress disorder. These thoughts, not being grounded in the reality of civilian life, make not an ounce of difference to Mike. These are the realities of his perceptions, the realities of his schema. In our experience of the world, whether it's at a magic show, our interactions with other people, or a response to a life stressor, we rely on pattern recognition to create these shortcuts for ourselves. But sometimes these shortcuts, which are essential to have in such a highly complex world, sometimes result in making inaccurate assumptions about the world. While at first glance, magic and therapy couldn't appear to be more different. Magic being about entertainment and deception. Therapy being about working through psychological or emotional distress. The underlying goals of magic and therapy are actually quite similar. With a magician's understanding of the mental shortcuts our brains take, he or she will strive to push the boundary of how their spectator sees something, how they think about something, challenging their perception and understanding of the world, compelling their spectator to ask. How did he do that? Magicians don't want you knowing the answer to that question, but you can bet they want you to ask it. You got a souvenir? Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm a psychologist. I, I can't afford that. <laughs> that wasn't nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Psychologists, depending on the theoretical approach they utilize, also strive to push the boundary of how their clients see things. They'll strive to understand where a client's core beliefs and automatic thoughts lay, how they reflect reality, and challenge the validity of those thoughts, assisting their clients in changing how they see themselves, the world, and the manner with which the world operates. Ultimately, both magicians and psychologists maintain the same goals of challenging the beliefs and the schemas of their respective audience, to expand their vision and understanding of the world, allowing one to consider different ways of thinking about things, to allow for different possibilities. To return to my earlier story about John, our 14-year-old teenager in that drug and alcohol rehab, in my very first interaction with him, I approached him with a deck of cards. And something changed in the room. At the time, I just saw magic as an easy way to connect with someone an easy way to lighten the intensity in the room. But I believe there was something more happening. I believe I was challenging how John thought about me as an adult and as an employee in a rehab. As I mentioned earlier, John's uh, early experiences of lying to and getting into trouble with the people around him was the result of, but also contributed to, his seeing people as inherently untrustworthy. But it also resulted in his expecting other people to see him the same way, 
and for other people to treat him a certain way. Here I come, with magic as my medium, presenting myself in a way that is completely inconsistent with how he has come to expect adults to interact with him. I believe this can set the stage for John to question how he thinks about his relationships and even how he thinks about himself. No, I'm not so naive to think that a simple card trick drastically changed this boy's life, but this interaction can serve as a piece of the puzzle or even as a catalyst for John to challenge his beliefs and his schemas for how he sees his relationships and for how he sees himself. This lesson can be drawn to our everyday lives. It's unlikely that anyone in this room or anyone who may see this talk lives a life without struggle in some capacity. How we think about our experiences are colored by these mental frameworks we have for the world. But by examining our beliefs, by examining our schemas, we can challenge the way we think about ourselves and the world, change how we respond to our environments, and create better lives for ourselves. So, some people say I'm a psychologist. Others, that I'm a magician. I say, what's the difference? Thank you very much.